Hi, I'm Machiavelli, and I'd still wreck Thorin at Quake, and I'm welcoming you to Thorin's YouTube channel. Yesterday, the 2nd of December, was the 20th birthday of the now legendary, iconic esports title, Quake 3 Arena. Which, by the way, for anyone who's unaware, it's often written Q3, Quake 3, the number. It's technically supposed to be the Roman numerals. It's supposed to be like the I, I, I to make the three. Just, just giving you some details there. So the interesting thing about this game is I was there before it was released. It actually, that was before I was actually a professional in esports. When I say I've been an esports historian since 2001, I mean I literally paid as a profession to do my job. I was actually back in the Quake scene in the original times. Sometimes I didn't have internet and I was just watching demos and reading sites. So I actually remember this game was highly anticipated, not just as a successor to Quake 2 and the Quake series and because id Software's games were enormous and massively popular, but it was a massively popular an online phenomenon generally for Quake, but specifically what made Quake 3 so anticipated is it had multiplayer that was the entire focus of the game. Now that might be lost on some people because maybe they're unaware. Quake and Quake 2 were mainly games made in the single player game mode where you're going through the levels and the bosses and doing all things and following the storyline. There's a very basic storyline, some shit cutscenes. And that was a game that just had a multiplayer mode tacked on. And hence why, aside from Romero making the DM maps, and, and obviously a couple of great ones in Quake 2, a lot of the maps, actually, we had to just take from the game itself and certain episodes in the game, obviously for TDM in, in um, Quake itself, TDM in Quake World. And that's because the main focus around the multiplayer in the early days was John Romero, and he was only there for Quake, and I think he was fired just before it came out, so he wasn't involved with Quake 2. So Quake 3 Arena, when it was announced, it was said it's going to have no storyline, the single player is just you playing against bots in a multiplayer setting, and it's mainly all about playing online, playing multiplayer, playing with other people with PCs. Now, to be fair, when I say it was highly anticipated, it wasn't in the sense that, like, Nobody knew what it would be like and what would it feel like. Because actually, much like past Quakes, they brought out a test version earlier on for people to play online who could then, as a result, send them error messages, like could obviously stress test it, etc. And so Q3 test had already come out six months earlier. And the, those of us who were hooked into the online world were already playing it, had already seen it. There would already even been tournaments in it. So the two maps off the top of my head that were in Quirk 3 test were the map that became DM17, The Longest Yard, and DM7, obviously a legendary TDM map, if you ever know that one, a classic map for teams like Ice Climbers, etc. Now, the early competitive scene, also in Q3 test, you had CPLs coming along there. Then, when Quake 3 came out in 1999, CPL, Cyber Athlete Professional League in Dallas, Texas, that was the big major. Like, there was two of those per year. Then World Cyber Games had come along as well. That was its, it was actually even the year before World Cyber Games. They had a World Cyber Games challenge before they launched the whole year by year by year approach with Samsung being the primary motivator and sponsor behind the tournament. That was a massive deal because whereas you went to America to play in the CPL or the smaller European CPL Europe events, when you went to World Cyber Games, the first few years it was in Korea. So that was an incredibly lo exotic location for pro gamers to attend and to fly out to. And just the experience meant it was almost worth winning the qualifier and as heavily contested qualifiers each year just for the crazy experience of getting to go to Asia at some point and play esports and be on stage and have an Olympic feel. Back when the biggest events in Quake in the West were held basically famously in the basement of the Hyatt Regency, like a three-star hotel in Dallas, Texas. Because, yeah, the basement's enormous, by the way, but you, you weren't in a massive setting. You didn't have a big stage setting. You had a very small amount of people watching. And it was mainly about bringing your own PC and then there being a tournament along with it. Now, it's worth pointing out, one of the problems Quake 3 had is it launched before the dot-com bubble burst. So for people who don't know... When the internet first came along, towards the end of the 2000s, people started to think it could be like what it is like now. And it had a sort of gold rush around it. I would compare to what Bitcoin had a few years ago. And so everyone was investing loads of money, pumping everything in, because they all thought that all the shopping and finance and all the television and streaming stuff that now exists was going to exist way earlier in the early 2000s, when actually none of the tech was ready and most people weren't on the internet and didn't care. It was a new hype that didn't really catch on as much in terms of making money. People didn't feel safe spending money on the internet. They thought it'd get scammed. In fact, they probably would in certain cases back then. So the bubble of the internet, all that money going in just based around like consumer interest, um, market valuations flying up and up and up, that burst, people say the burst took place from March 2000 to October 2002. So that encompassed, unfortunately, 
the prime of when Quake 3 Arena needed to blast off to be the biggest esports game ever. Now, Q3 test had already had two big CPLs. It had the Ground Zero event, which famously took place in New York, downtown, a year or two, I think it was two years maybe, before 9-11 happened, which is why it's one of the craziest pieces of trivia that it was just called Ground Zero as an event. Then they had an event, one that they'd already held different iterations of in past quicks, Frag. So Frag 3 was one. It was famously the one where we first saw Fatality attend a big event, finished third place. The first true pro scene was around back then, but we're talking about like a few people making a real living. I mean, before then, people would say there was a pro scene in as much as they were the best players and they played and some of them had sponsorships and went to tournaments. But realistically, they were just dedicated semi-pros or people who really liked Quake and had some time free to play or were in a reasonable place. There wasn't the same teams and pro gamers thing before Quake 3 Arena. So along came Quake 3 Arena. And why I say it's a true pro scene is, first of all, loads more people were getting salary and sponsorships. There was teams that had legit money and could afford to send you places and pay you a salary. There were qualifiers sometimes all over the world, specifically all over America for the big CPLs. You could also win the qualifier against domestic talent and get flown either to another qualifier like poker WSOP style, or you could get flown all the way to the main event and then you competed. Hence, we had players coming from Australia and Europe and Sweden. Well, I mean, obviously it's in Sweden, but I mean like general Europe, like central Europe, etc. And loads of people from North America. We even had someone come all the way from Korea who finished third in one of the big CPLs early on. There was media attention, but obviously it was just like newspapers writing it up, small pieces. There was a piece on CNN famously that had Machiavelli, the legendary dueler, around the end of 2000 for the Babish's CPL. The prize pool started to get bigger. Now you were getting like maybe a $200,000, $150,000 prize pool. First place for the Razor CPL in March of 2000, I think it was March or April, was $40,000 for Fatality the winner. So along came this time, but the problem is... The Razor CPL, the big prize money, esports is going to blow. People like Sujoy quit being like a financial like investment banker or something in living in New York to become a pro gamer because he thought he was going to make more and have more fun. The problem is then the bubble started to crash. Now, the problem is that basically meant that Quake 3 only lasted competitively for one more year as the number one esports title in the world. What happened was after that year... Counter-Strike had come along already in 99 and hit its critical mass in 2001, the year after this game sort of started to fade out in terms of Quake 3. The first time in big esports orgs decided they wanted it to be a business, and so whereas they'd done Quake because that was the game of the people who went to LAN parties, now they swapped to Counter-Strike because the player base was bigger and they thought that they could get more money in as a result. In terms of the reception of Quake 3, this is going to be very misunderstood because now it's hailed by some people as the greatest game ever, greatest Quake game ever. People love it who play Quake. It basically is what they often play. Most people do play Quake if they're not playing Quake Champions now, which, I mean, who the fuck is, to be fair. What they might not know is the reception of the game wasn't that good. On the one hand, it was really cool, the premise, because it did bring together Quake World and Quake 2 Pros, largely a separate class of players generally, because Quake 2 came out so quickly after Quake, and Quake still had a lot of lifespan, it's still being played to this day as Quake World, especially in the Nordic region. And so, in kind of like CSGO brought together some 1.6 players and some Source Pros, and we finally got to see them properly go head-to-head, -head, you got those kinds of, like, legacy matchups, which would have been ridiculous. You could already shadow box those if you were a fan of the other two Quake games. So you could have Lakerman, the best Quake World player, against Machiavelli, the best Quake 2 player at the end. You could have Duma, an infamous godlike TDM player and pretty good dueler in Quake World from Clan 9. He could play against Immortal, a legendary godlike dueler from Quake 2. And you could have these fantasy super fights as they were. The problem is, among pros from those games specifically, the game was a critical failure. Machiavelli, legendary Quake 2 player, who, by the way, in early Quake 3 was also banging. This guy was fucking placing top players since he was one of the only people who could play Fatality close. He had an incredible style. He was one of the first true pros. He even did that, like, sort of puff piece I said earlier for the Babbage's CPL on their behalf for CNN and he was very well spoken. I'll see if I can link the video if I can find it. Came off very, very well. He could even literally talk terminology of the tech industry because he was a guy who just, even though in the game he was a bit spicy, he was a very intelligent guy actually. One of the interesting things was he was someone who would speak out where some of the others wouldn't because their bottom line depended on it. And they would say, ah, it's not a bad game. It might get fixed soon. He would even say, like, this game's bad, basically, compared to where Quake 2 was at. And then, as a result, he was one of the early pros who actually put their support behind the pro mode. Pro mod, or pro mode, it's the same shit. Pro mod, 
uh, project, which was originally conceptualized to take the best elements of Quake World and Quake 2, build them into a, one thing that was a mod of Quake 3, and it became infamous in the Polish scene, and a few people in America played it. But the main problem with that game was it was too hardcore, and actually, I think in the end, it didn't really satisfy either of the sets of fans, because Quake World and Quake 2 were distinctly different, but in a very coherent way, and a way where you kind of preferred one or the other, typically, I thought. And so it kind of made it just a mishmash. I always describe it as like, if you take all your favorite ice creams and mix them together, they won't taste better than the ice creams on their own, in my opinion. They just become kind of a mess, and, and it's actually, it doesn't work. The flavors are all over the place. It's the reason why when people construct music, scents, etc., tastes of food, they especially layer elements in so that something is tasted first, followed by another thing which moves you into a last thing, which maybe has a little surprise at the end and then goes into something pleasant. Like, there's a way of constructing the notes as they were when it's, we're talking about perfume. Now, some of the flaws that they had in the game back then, some of them were overcome by developments of the players and playing the game a lot. Most of them, though, I've got to say, were very legitimate criticisms and a lot of them hold to this day. So the machine gun was way too powerful a starting weapon and meant that when you spawned, if your opponent didn't have much armor and health, you would just instantly kill him and then all of a sudden you're back in control. Or potentially the game's at a stalemate, whereas he did all the work of killing you, etc. Now, in the past, in Quake 2, in Quake World, the starting weapon, the shotgun and the blaster, are absolutely pitiful. And as a result, the game's about strategy, tactics, run if you're on the spawn, try and get to a weapon, don't necessarily fight immediately. The guy in control, control means something, you can keep running it. That was a problem for me. It took away some of the strategical and tactical elements of the game, made it more just about skill and a little bit of luck. The movement, at the, especially in the beginning, when there wasn't a lot of like the strafe jumping and people hadn't figured out how to get max speed like they have in the defrag days, the movement, quite frankly, wasn't as skillful as either Quake World, which had proper air acceleration bunny hopping, or Quake 2, which had the really advanced strafe jumping that actually some of it came into Quake 3, but never to the same degree. Some of the like double jumps you could do in Quake 2 were amazing. Again, this is why I don't think the Pro Mod never really made sense to mishmash all those styles together. It also made armor less meaningful, which again hit the strategic game. Like armor in the previous Quakes were about literally, like they controlled the percentage of damage done to you. Armors in Quake just all stacked a certain number, so the shittiest armor was just that amount, a, a, a percentage, no, not a percentage, it was just like, say it was 50, 25, 50, and then another's 100, that the 50 and 100, as it stacks up, etc., doesn't mean anything in that sense, it's still the same, whereas in Quick World, Quick 2, it's about the specific armor you have, and so as a result, it actually made armor less meaningful, the weapon spawns were well, nowadays, to be fair, in Quake World and Quake 2, at the end they changed this as well. I never liked this. They changed the weapon spawns so that weapons were just always there or weapons spawn within five seconds and you could top up armor very easily or you could just immediately get to a gun when he spawned, therefore, again, removing elements of why control was so essential. I personally never liked that. Get to that in a minute. There was also, quite frankly, out of the gate, no classic game, uh, classic mode. And the problem is, Quake and Quake 2 very early had the classic maps. You had DM4, DM6, DM2. In Quake World, in Quake 2, you obviously had Q2, DM1, Q2, DM3. These were instant classics for free-for-all, for TDM, for 1v1. The problem in Quake 3 was it took a while before they were really established because, for example, you might say, wait a minute, Thorin, the campgrounds, Q2, DM6, then you didn't follow the early games of Quake 3 because in the early days of Quake 3, without the strafe jumping, when people are walking and running around just normally, that map was way too big for 1v1. It made for a terrible Razor CPL final. Then you might say, well, what about uh, Tony 4, right? Tony 4 at the time also wasn't that great a map. It had, uh, it had um, a scenario where whoever controlled the top level, the other guy basically had to come up on some sort of a bounce pad. So he would just dominate with the rail. Like there wasn't that much strategy involved in it. Q2 was a nightmare. People would, Tony 2 rather, people would just hide around corners with the LG, go through the teleporter concept. It was actually very gimmicky. It lacked a lot of the nuance and, and strategy that Quake, not at the end of its lifespan before this had, but even at the beginning had and had so much depth to it. So I actually personally thought it was a bit of a hacky game. Man, and then I've also got, in line with a lot of these, I knew from interviews the philosophy behind why this these changes were made, which is John Carmack, who was then left to be the sole head of the company instead of just like the genius engine programmer, and then Carmack be, uh, Romero being the guy who's the guy who um, designs the levels and comes up with the theme and makes it cool and understands multiplayer and even plays multiplayer. Carmack wasn't that guy. So as a result, Carmack did an interview around Quake 3 where he basically suggested that he'd watched some um, games of the best 
Duelers in Quake, I think it was Quake, NetQuake even, which is what Americans played instead of Default Quake or Quake World that we played in Europe. And I think he was talking perhaps even about the infamous Red Annihilation tournament where Thresh came along and won his Ferrari Testarossa. And he basically suggested that these games were boring to watch these 1v1s because the person who was better would dominate the other, by the way, in the same way as in a wrestling match that might happen or a boxing match or a sporting event generally. And he actually thought that was boring for spectators, that the better player winning by 10 frags just meant he was in control all the time, made it boring. He wanted it to be, he said, more like a basketball game where you never know until the fourth quarter or late in the fourth quarter who's going to win the game. There's always excitement. There's always ways to come back. Now, personally, I think that's a bit whack. And I personally think that's why Quake 3... Eventually, because it was played for so long and people got so excellent, I think they overcame or transcended some of the limitations of the game. But as an inherent game in terms of its design philosophy, I think it's inferior to Quake World and even Basic Quake and Quake 2. So I personally subscribe to a lot of the, the problems I've said before. I loved 1v1 in Quake 2 and Quake as a weapon control game. I thought it added so much extra to the game. You not only had to control armor and armor and where the person spawns, but you had to control the weapons. So if on DM2, you couldn't get to the rocket launcher, now maybe you have to gamble and go down and get that lightning gun, then hit a crazy shot when you come out. Like, this made for a really interesting approach. And it's why, in my opinion, people like Thresh were basically unbeatable. Because there was more elements of the game they could utterly control with strategy, timing, reading the opponent. So I thought it made for a more skillful... It was more like chess, virtual chess, with skill involved back then. Thresh, for my money, never had close to the best aim in either Quake or Quake 2. But he could dominate everyone else, even the craziest aimers in the world. Now, in the post.com bubble crash, Quake kept going, but it was ESWC, run out of France, Esports World Cup, starting in 2003, and it was QuakeCon, which had always existed, but then became way more prominent 2002 onwards, when CPL had died out. It was the last year of WCG. QuakeCon, obviously, a festival for Quake and id Software games run by id Software, and it's free, so bizarrely, their tournaments would say that sometimes be a bit wonky, because anyone from the YRC could sign up to the big money tournament for 1v1, and so famously people like Lexa, godlike Russian player, would sign up and just hope they got in, and they did. There were years when people didn't get into some of these tournaments. When the CPL and WCG bailed and pivoted to other games, you still had these tournaments, Quake come with big money, but once a year, ESWC once a year, but way smaller money, like 5,000 euros, I suppose like 20k for first place mid at Quake Con. There would still be dedicated pros. Most of the top players kept playing. They still wanted to play just for the sake of being great. That's one of the things I love about the early days of esports. Then years later, Quake Live, which essentially is just a ported, tweaked version of Quake 3, took up the baton. Now, in the meantime, some of them went and played the Painkiller World Tour in 2005. Some of them played Quake 4 when that was a big game, 2005 to 2007. Quake 3 even had a slight resurgence. It came back for 2008. That's when Cypher actually truly emerged as a god tier player. Rafa was beginning to emerge and show some of his skills and how he was five steps ahead, as it were. Another factor, outside of 1v1, Team Deathmatch was a big deal in the early days. You had the clan base Euro Cup, so if you finished top four, you would qualify to the land finals. You Sometimes you had to pay your own way there. And if you went there, you'd play the best teams and you'd see who the best team in Europe was. In America, you had the Quake Invitation League for a couple of seasons. You had Frag 4, which actually was TDM at that point in time, which had some European teams, some uh, North American team, and most of the North American teams, that was back at the end of 2000, uh, or in 2000 rather, I think. These were big deals competitively. They weren't in terms of money and being a pro, but they were just in terms of being the best. Very entertaining as well. Great mishmash of styles and different teams winning in different years and super teams and big dramas. One player sort of moved from one team to another and then made them win or lose. CTF as a mod was never as big, but it had its own dedicated subculture and sub-community. People who just played that. People like Audi from Dignitas came out, actually, of CTF. I think even in, in uh, maybe Unreal Tournament CTF, I think Red Eye even came out of that scene. In terms of the modding aspect... This is where games themselves started to lock off some of the features in terms of people not being as interested. Aside from Pro Mode, which was only sort of influential, it was very, very hardcore, it didn't actually, Quake 3 Arena, spawn a mod as influential as Counter-Strike, which came from Quake, or Dota, which obviously came from Warcraft 3. Nothing comparable in that particular sense. Other aspects of Quake 3, they obviously had the speedrunning, defrag. Now, I've always loved those movies. They're really entertaining to watch. I'll link one here just for people to get, check out what they are. I was never interested in doing it myself. Speedrunning in general, I'm not that interested, but they just made these movies. They always had sick drum and bass slash electronic music soundtracks, which was just thumping <laughs> some driving beat. And then obviously the skills look sick and it's really, you do get that like adrenaline rush of he's going so fast and so crazy in the movement. In terms of frag movies generally, 
there were so many in Quick, so many classics. I'm actually thinking of doing a series where I try to find as many as I can on YouTube without the sound disabled or find download links and do a series where I just introduce people to the classic ones. Because especially in Quake and Counter-Strike, there are so many amazing ones. I think some people would get a kick out of watching or old fans would like to see resurrected and talked about again. Demos were a huge thing in Quake, not least because POV demos in that game were some of the absolute best because they were incredibly small size. I'm talking about less than a meg for the whole match. They would be perfect quality as if you were just playing the game practically, unless they were recorded like as a weird third person spectator in the server. They put CS demos to shame for a long time. CS demos were shit for many years. HLTV was appalling in terms of demos for most of 1.6 because they were working off an older engine and then they wouldn't update HLTV for literally a decade. They didn't give a fuck about esports back then. So Quake 3 Arena, a classic game. Now that I've seen in the modern day, people mastered the movement and the weapons and we got to a point where more of the maps were understood and played and we had a great scene of players and a development of the meta game. Eventually, it did become a very good game. Not the best esports game for my money, not even the best Quake game. But 20 years of it, what a fantastic game. The amount that we got out of this, the min-max of how much we paid for this, for how much we got out of it and how much a lot of us put into it, it's crazy and it's absolutely worthy of celebration. Even though now it's probably gone, I don't know if it'll ever come back. It was a special time in esports and a special time in many people's lives. This video was kindly supported by Alexander Rao, Blunt Smoking Anus Destroyer, Dean Koskley, Dean Tanglis, Ho Chi Mao, J Dobbs, Mohamed Al Abdul Razak, Nate D-O-double-G, Patrick Ribeiro, Tobias Bernasconi, Who the Fuck is Viathan, and special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Would you like to ask me a question for my monthly video AMA? Do you want teasers for upcoming content that I've got? Do you want to take part in a discussion with me? Well, if you would like any of these perks or to support my work, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.